So this webinar will provide uh, an update on the Living Cultures project. Over the next hour or so, we'll be discussing the topic of self-representation through film. Um, so could, the, could I ask all the panelists just to switch on your video cameras, please, just to, for a, little, a short time, just to say hello to everybody so you, they can see your faces. Um, so I'm really delighted to welcome all the panelists. Um, we have with us um, Maasai leaders from Tanzania and Kenya. We have Amos Loika, Samuel Nangiria, Scholar Loika, and plus, we are really excited uh, at the last moment, um, literally, we have two extra uh, guests joining us, old friends who visited Oxford on, on past delegations. We have Yannick Ndoinyo, who's actually in Oxford at the moment doing an MA. Welcome, Yannick. And uh, Shomet, uh, our elder. Uh, we're really delighted to see you here today as well, Shomet. Um, just for listening in to the, to the webinar and hopefully there'll be a little bit of time right at the end for, for you to add any reflections or comments. Um, so we also have with us uh, from the Pitt Rivers Museum, of course, the museum director, Laura van Brockhoven. Really great to have you here. Thanks for, your, for spending the time and um, research assistant Tandiwe Wilson and uh, uh, Andy behind the scenes. Thanks, Andy, for um, doing all the technical support and setting us all up. Um, <clears throat> so um, let's get started. We're going to uh, hand over, I'm going to hand over to Laura, first of all, just to set the scene and give us a little bit of an update. Thank you, Nick. And yeah, I'm happy to. And I, uh, Scola has also joined us. So I'm really happy that Scola is here too. Um, and um, it's um, exciting to um, be in this room together with all of you. And it's really quite nice to see that people are um, joining us from, um, from far away places, um, from Canada and from the US and from Hertfordshire. Um, so it's really um, been quite a strange year, obviously, but uh, I still have very vividly uh, the memory of all of us being here um, together in uh, January and February of 2020. This project started actually in 2017 when Sam Samuel Langiria um, came to an, um, a leadership program that Inside Chair had organized for indigenous leaders. And we had uh, uh, agreed that we would bring out some objects uh, from uh, the different indigenous leaders um, places of origin. Um, and when Sam saw some of those objects and he'll speak to that much better than I can, he was very, um, he was quite shocked and immediately said, oh, this is problematic. I don't understand how these things could have ever ended up here. I don't understand the language that you're using. Why are you talking about collected and why are you talking about missionaries who who's, who's donated these collections. Um, what right did they have when you talk about collecting were these things just on the floor, no. So there were a whole range of elements um, that were being picked up by Sam very uh, astutely saying, this is problematic. I don't understand how um, you're using this sort of language um, without any precision around the moment of taking because some of these objects must have been taken through processes that are really problematic. He also um, flagged that he thought that the fact that some of these objects that were objects of inheritance were taken were still causing problems for the families probably of who those objects had been taken. Um, and so in today they were causing problems. And he said, I'll take this um, home to the elders and I'm going to speak to some of the elders of in Loliondo in the community um, and um, then we'll come back to you. So uh, Sam went home and we then um, and sent an email really outlining very precisely what the problem was. And um, then we received a video with um, eight elders in Loliondo talking how annoyed, annoyed, annoyed they were at these objects being in the UK without their involvement. Uh, the fact also that we hadn't at all reached out to, um, to the communities to uh, talk about the objects. And, and some of the questions that were then in the sort of ongoing um, years have been posed to us have been very sort of um, specific around um, 
why are these connections? Why did it take you so long to talk to people um, in, um, in the Maasai um, territories to actually connect and see how you would better care for them, what their meaning is. And so that actually sort of was the start of a project where receiving the video, I returned the video with the help of Inside Chair and several of our staff saying, why don't we start the conversations? We invited the delegation over and we've had very generous support of different funds to bring over um, delegations, which then um, on the side of the um, Maasai side in Kenya and Tanzania, it was uh, decided who, would, who, who the delegation would consist of um, and how they would be able to feed back to the Maasai community more broadly. Um, and also we used a lot of video and film in the process. And I think that is where, uh, because Inside Share um, have trained, trained um, a lot of indigenous communities that they work with uh, to make sure that they that there's advocacy can be done by the filmmakers themselves which um, are trained uh, filmmakers some of the um, film that was made was very um, prominently it played a very prominent role in the process um, what happened was that in 2018, the first delegation came that worked, and, and, and Shomet is here, and Yannick and Skola, who were all part of the, of the, of the delegation, uh, the, a sort of mixed delegation from Kenya and Tanzania, coming to the museum, uh, identifying within the Pit Rivers Museum's collections five objects that were really problematic. Um, of the 188, um, they indicated that there would be more spiritual guidance that was needed and um, they went back to um, Chief Laibon Mokombo. Laibon is a, a seer, one could say, who can see the future and the past and interpret it um, within the Maasai epistemology, a way of knowing. Um, and um, Mokombo has been guiding the process ever since um, and had indicated that um, there would need to be a reading of, with an Enkidong and the Enkidong is a sacred calabash uh, that is used to read. Um, and, and again, I'm just sort of explaining the context a little bit, but um, Sam and uh, Amos and Francis and Skolak and, um, and uh, Yannick can explain all of this much better than I can. Uh, so what happened is in 2018, those five objects were identified. These are really problematic. We need to start a ceremonial process around understanding with greater precision who these objects were taken from. That's when in 2020, there was a next delegation that came, a uh, bigger delegation, biggest delegation uh, sort of cross, um, uh, you know, from Kenya and Tanzania that has come to uh, the UK to work in a museum. And uh, that really led to uh, quite precise information on where these objects, how they were taken, where they were taken. Much of that information we had, um, we had and have been guided very much by Mokombo's um, guidance ever since. Um, and also, you know, sort of have employed, obviously, the sort of epistemologies that are at our disposition in uh, museum, uh, in museum ways of working, in trying to find as much information as we could on the historical documents that we have. Often those are not very precise, um, but also looking at, okay, what kind of information can be found? And that's where Jessica Frankopan has played as a researcher has been, and Tandy Way Wilson have been playing a really important component in the sort of finding information, more broad information on the provenance of the objects. Now, um, Sam and Amos will be able to report on the videos they've made since, obviously, you know, just when, um, Sam and, and the, the, the 2020 delegation was returning home, um, the pandemic struck and uh, we um, were sort of forced to, you know, confined within the borders that we live in, both um, that had a really big impact both on the UK, but especially also between Kenya and Tanzania, it was much more difficult to have any communications, but once that was possible again, a delegation of um, Amos and Sam and uh, Francis Chomet went to Mokombo and we received a report with Mokombo's guidance. He outlined how um, what was really important to him was that the process had to be held in as a peaceful process with respect at the center of it, that 
Um, secondly, the consultation and healing must involve two parties, both we needed to try and find the UK, you know, um, descendants of the UK families that were involved in the process of the taking, um, and the Maasai communities would identify the families that were um, affected by the taking of the um, objects, which is where Mokombo has led on that process. Again, Sam and Amos will be able to talk about that in more detail. And then thirdly, the partnership uh, was really about, needed to be guided by and developed within the, the sort of framework where the mutual interests are taken into account and taken care of. Um, and fourthly, that we would use the Maasai conflict management system of Elata on Giro uh, in the process. And that um, we as UK partners will be made to understand how that works. And I think that is where we are currently at, where um, we're looking at um, that process on how do we take that forward around the care of those five particular objects, plus there's also six objects that have been identified in Cambridge um, as equally problematic that they are within UK collections. Um, further to that, and while we were all stuck at home and sort of working from home and working within the confinement of for, for Kenya and Tanzania, very much also colonial boundaries of not being able to cross those boundaries. We, um, Tandi has been doing a huge amount of work uh, working around sort of collaborative consent and intellectual property because one of the elements of work that was also um, identified in 2017 and 18 was where um, Sam and Scola and others sort of very uh, prominently said, we, especially to our education team, could you please stop talking for us? We want to be able to be involved in talking about ourselves. We want to self-represent. We want to self-determine how we're being presented. And that's where Tandi has been working uh, with the education team and with um, the whole, you know, with Juliana and Scola and um, Evelyn and, and many others um, of the uh, Maasai um, communities to identify what is it that we would be talking about. Is there videos you could make? And I'll let um, Tandi talk about a lot of that. We also would be collecting new handling collection objects. Um, again, that's where um, others will talk about that process. I'm just giving it as a, as a framework. And uh, we've tried to identify, Jess, Jessica and Tandi have been working together to identify uh, UK family uh, members, um, which has not been easy because for many of the objects, um, the, the information that we have is quite um, limited. And um, one of the questions that was asked when um, Laibon Nomaron, uh, who is uh, Mokombo's son, was here with the Enkidong, with the sacred calabash, doing the reading of the objects, was how many hands did these objects go through before they ended up in the museum's collections? And for many of them, it was five hands or eight hands. So even when we know who collected the, who brought the object into the museum, we often don't really know who was involved in the collecting or the taking of the objects um, at the moment of taking. Um, I think that's where I would, you know, sort of because I've been talking much too long probably already, um, I'll keep, I'll leave it at that and um, hand over back to you, uh, Nick. Thank you, Lara. Now that was that was brilliant. You managed to get lots of information. There's, it's, uh, there's a lot to talk about with this project. Um, and of course, th today, the purpose is to focus on a particular thing, which is the self representation using video. <clears throat> but it's there's so much important context <laughs> to, um, to set the scene. And you did a great job to doing that. Thanks a lot, Laura. Um, so yeah, so I really I'd like to invite um, Amos and Scholar and Sam to switch your videos on so we can see your faces. And I'm going to ask you some. That's it. Hi, Sam. Hi, Amos. So, um, Sam, perhaps you could start. Hi, hi, Scholar. So yeah, my first question, Sam, is um, in terms of decolonizing museums, what does self-representation mean to you and why is it important? Uh, please don't forget to unmute you, yourself. 
thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I'm, I'm Samuel from Tanzania, from Maasai community. And uh, the colonization is very wide. But when it comes to indigenous communities, um, it means uh, a situation where you can speak, you can act, you can represent yourself. A situation where you cannot be shadowed, a situation where somebody cannot tell or cannot talk about you without your consent, a situation where you stand on your own and tell about uh, who you are and um, what is your culture and what does it uh, entails and what it means to you that uh, it identifies you as an indigenous person. So for us, this is so important because um, Go on, Sam. Okay. Yes, I'm here. So uh, for us, this is so critical and important because uh, indigenous communities all over the world have gone through a very um, horrible history of uh, colonization. And uh, we see that is still happening now in even in post-colonial environment. Our governments, um, uh, global um, systems, uh, UN, and many others do not really understand um, the history, the darkest part of history we have gone through. So uh, this is the time that is so important for us as indigenous people, for us as Maasai community, to be able to speak and to let people know exactly what we've gone through and why are we still struggling with contemporary issues, including um, development that is designed um, against our will, um, land issues, uh, culture, and future for that matter. So this is why it is so important uh, for us to be in the center of telling who we are and to be able to decolonize the cultural spaces, including the museum, because we know um, a big part of the collections in the museums are actually coming from indigenous communities. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Samuel. Um, and uh, Scholar, can you describe, uh, please, for us, how um, how have you been using participatory video so far in this project um, in the different stages, particularly at the, near the beginning in the, in, the, in the part that you when you when you came to Oxford and when you returned back to uh, your community? How, how was video used for you and how was it uh, a useful tool? Yeah, thank you, Nick. Uh, I'm Skola from Kenya. And uh, I'm happy to be one of the speakers of the meeting today. Just want to say that uh, PV has become a great tool to us as the indigenous community because through PV, like has been say that uh, since the time that we went to UK in the in, in 2018, uh, from the start we started having a the whole process taken in, taken by camera. And through that, when we came back to, uh, to Kenya and Tanzania, we brought all the objects in video form back to the community where we have been uh, streaming, uh, giving the feedback of what we have got from the museum. And from there, our community got uh, everything in clear uh, form because all the probl problematic objects that we have been discussing in the museum, they have seen them. And uh, from there, we did a consultation uh, meeting from both sides, Kenya and Tanzania, we are whereby we had uh, both elders uh, from the two countries. And from there, we got a, a, another clip where we have sent back to UK. And from there, now the two, the two parties have come together through the PC discussing the same thing, getting on the same track through the PV. 
The consultation has been taken back. Uh, the, the, the problematic objects have been brought to Kenya through the camera to the elders. And from there, the problematic objects have been discussed by the elders and taken back to the UK. So it seems like the two parties are sitting in the same table discussing the same thing. So the distance doesn't matter because now we have a camera which has brought us together. And also, the uh, chief liberal through the camera has spoken all the things that he wanted to be done, all the consultations that he wanted to be done and sent back to the UK through the camera. So I can say a camera has been our speaking tool. And through that, we, have, we are coming to get the healing through the camera. Thank you. Thank you, Scholar. That's very beautiful that the camera has been your healing tool. Um, Amos, <clears throat> you recently, um, and on several occasions, but very recently, I believe in just in the last few days, you have visited um, the spiritual leader of the Maasai, Laibon Mokombo, um, whose son and heir came uh, with you uh, to Oxford in February 2020. Um, could you tell us, please, what does Mokombo think about the video tool? How has he, what has been his response? Are you are you okay, Amos? Are you okay to speak, or maybe I could ask Sam. Are you there? Okay, you're good. Are you good to speak, Amos? You're muted. Yeah, if you could just um, add add to what Scholar has been saying uh, about really the, the, the use of video specifically as a tool for self-representation and how important it's been in this process from the point of view of Mokompo and the spiritual leadership that's been able to guide uh, the delegation, but also the, um, the museum, um, uh, the, the, you know, the, institute, the institution of the museum. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nick, and everyone. My name is Amos Leukta. Uh, I came from Kenya. And as uh, discussed by Laura and Nick in the introduction part, we are able to meet Mokombo on several occasions, discussing about the problematic object which are held in uh, Pit River Museum. And recently in our visit, he emphasized on the issue of a peaceful reconciliation and a healing process. And in that aspect, he insists that uh, he's still uh, willing to guide the process. And as he had said previously that they need the commitment from the families in the UK and those in Maasai to bring a peaceful reconciliation. And he still say that we, we have to guide a peaceful process because the party involved now are not the one who have done this, but this one are now bringing peace. So the, uh, the museum as a representative and the inside share as the people who connected these two parties, now he will take the initiative of bringing that reconciliation process. So he say he we told him about the this webinar that uh, we have sent what he told us after the delegation uh, of 2020, which Laura say that we have been disrupted more by COVID because of border closure and also the restriction of visitors visiting the chief level. Then after that he said that uh, the first question he asked us have how the museum have received my message of peace because he don't want to engage his community on another task of war or conflict and after that we give the story and we show him the video of what we have done in the uk we show the video of how the senior management team are able to talk about our delegation and reaction of the communication from the film or video. And in response to that, 
he say that he's happy that his son, Lamaron, was able to take his duty and identify the family in the UK. And he was traced the family. Back home, he, he also further used the sacred calabash in Gidong to trace the five families where the problematic object come from when he's one. Well, he, he traced uh, the four family, he identified the four family in the beginning and one family was missing in the first place. But lately, he come to identify that family and say that, fine, he has now got all the family. But in Maasai, you cannot break the news of such a magnitude to a family without proper channel. So he, in his recent, in our recent visit, he identified Lemaron and he appointed him as the man to take the lead in reaching the family. But this, the reaching the family will come as a result of our conversation today on how we can agree upon how we can reach the family so that we can break the news. Up to now, we have not break the news to the family. We know the family ourselves, but we don't have that authority as the representative until we agree upon as, uh, as this team, CM ourselves, and also uh, Mokombo, that is when he will choose the elders, the representative of the Maasai section, uh, led by his son, because uh, he's, he, he is uh, old now. So he's the one who's sent to represent in such occasion. So that is what he say. And he's still willing and insisting on a peaceful reconciliation and a peaceful process that will not bring any conflict to either party. The other thing he insists is about cleansing two families, the UK family and the, uh, and the uh, Maasai family. He says that for a process to be so much uh, holistic and bring a lasting peace, we need to see how we can reach those families, even if they trace their descendant, so that we can have uh, that reconciliation. Because this is a lasting peace. It's not like we are trying to pay something because there is nothing equal to a human being that we can value. It's just something that will give us a peace that in the, in, the, in the image of our society, we feel that at least we are now reconciled and we can forge our, our journey together without the feeling that you have destroyed my life, our family are, are suffering. So at the moment, we know that the family, uh, but we don't have the authority to break the news until we get such a kind of uh, process which we can form together and move forward. Maybe I can give Samuel to add on what I have, may be missing. Thank you. Thank you, Amos. Thank you, Amos. Yes, please, please do um, do add add something to that, Sam. Uh, and uh, just in a, in a short while, we'll be also showing a couple of uh, short videos that have been made quite recently um, by the Maasai video teams um, on two two of the particular. Um, Problematic artifacts, and um, <clears throat> which which will would never be given away under any circumstances. They are inherited from father to son, from mother to daughter, um, and therefore they are seen as very problematic. They should not have left Maasai land, um, and they need somehow to be returned to those families. That there's a a belief that, that in fact those families may well have suffered uh, extreme trauma in the uh, 100 years or so since those objects were taken from them. And there's a very, very urgent and important um, need to, to, uh, to, to, to undergo a, a healing and reconciliation process. So thanks for explaining a little bit more about that, uh, Amos. Sam, have you got anything to add? And then we'll, um, then we'll uh, bring in Tandy to, uh, Tandiwe to tell us a little bit about how the museum has been um, working on, um, on the narratives, on improving the narratives uh, through the proper self-representation by the, by the delegates over the last few years. So, Sam. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, maybe something to add is um, the first time we shot Mokombo, the videos, is the time he said, I need to, to bless the camera. He said the camera, what we know about the camera is it belongs to the West, it belongs to a white man. Because we normally see the white men and women carrying the camera, 
and we are very much afraid about what they use it to for. So when we see our sons, our daughters, um, carrying the camera and giving us reliable information from the other side, and also be able to send, uh, take the information from here to the to the museums. Uh, this is um, a very very reliable um, way of using uh, this machine. So he blessed, and he said, "From now, my administration will adopt as a way of communicating, a meeting, engaging, especially." Um, the far end where we cannot easily travel. So this is what he said. And yes, there's a, there's so many questions about um, whether you know how to, if you break it, do you know how to make, how, how do you repair it? And um, um, where do you keep it at home? So these are some of the questions, but he also said, whose camera is this? How much did you buy it? And so uh, there are so many questions, um, practically how, who trained you how to use it? Are you the one who made this video? Um, and you, if you uh, take my film now, can you send it now here? Can I speak maybe through the camera to the people? So um, it was very, very happy because he said it's just like Engidong because Engidong can also go to Farent. Um, don't have to travel to UK to be able to assess what people are doing. Um, so um, this is what he said and he's very happy. And he said his administration uh, will adopt as one way to send and receive information. Thanks, Sam. That's so fascinating to hear how the spiritual leader of the Maasai, Makompo, a man in, I guess, in his 80s, has really sure. fully embraced. Is that right? How old is he? Do you know? Yeah, he's, in, um, you don't know, but he should be 80 plus. 80 plus, 80. yeah, who, who's fully embraced this uh, technology. And um, it's, it's really yeah. fascinating, fascinating to hear that. Thank you. So <clears throat> now we're going to... Um, Sorry, I'm just going to pull up my run of show. Yeah, so Tandiwe, uh, we'd love to welcome you now to uh, to tell us about how the Living Cultures is influencing how the museum approaches educational programming, uh, the guiding principles of this work, and why community authored films are a large part of the process. So over to you. Hi, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. So I am I'm Tandy and I'm the research assistant for the Living Cultures uh, project. And for the past few months, I've been working with everyone to develop focused resources that can be integrated into learning at the Pitt Rivers. So I'm going to take a few moments to talk about how the, the project is influencing how the museum approaches uh, educational programming, uh, why we're doing this work, the guiding principles uh, that we are adhering to, and why community authored film is such an integral part of, uh, of, of this process. So as you know, uh, museums are places of learning and uh, as academically trustworthy strongholds, they are ideal for encouraging open conversation uh, around uh, objective historical truth because the information that we, we share, the information we teach and the resources we look after help us to understand the uh, human experience. It has long been a goal of museum education and outreach uh, teams to develop programming about uh, collections that work for audiences in ways that relate to relevant and contemporary issues. Um, uh, topics around identity, um, uh, um, uh, uh, history, geography, and also teachings uh, around creating sustainable futures and tackling issues related to the afterlives of colonialism. Um, as I say this, uh, this is in motion, um, but ethnographic and world culture museums certainly have this uh, undertapped potential to unpack these themes in their educational programming using um, more inclusive and collaborative uh, practices. Furthermore, uh, there is also a responsibility to develop this work with a notion of care at its heart and to also seek uh, sustainable and stakeholder driven solutions because the stewardship of this cultural uh, heritage uh, has global reverberations as you're hearing. So the Pitt Rivers Museum's guiding principles state that we should respect relationships between people, objects, pasts, uh, presents and futures, 
and also respectfully listen and learn from our uh, stakeholders and audiences. To do this, uh, we're attempting to restore balance by working hand in hand and building trust and confidence with different communities. And uh, uh, yes, of course, this has been part and parcel of uh, practice with, with years of dedicated community outreach, uh, research and teaching partnerships, whether that's been with local, uh, international um, diaspora communities um, who are indigenous leaders, uh, activists, artists, researchers, you, you name it. Somewhere we need to apply this practice more is in public education and it is happening and it's really exciting. Um, but I say we need to apply it more because if we don't work in this way, we run the risk of voice appropriation and uh, even inadvertently applying Eurocentric uh, subjective judgments about other cultures in our teaching. But ultimately museums are really keen to tackle uh, these programming issues uh, by foregrounding self-representation uh, the major hurdle is working with the information that has been documented in the museum's database records um, and then reaching communities to impact and rebuild sessions with um, equitable exchange and consultation throughout. So during the last uh, visit in 2020, it was uh, raised that information being taught to children about Maasai communities was not factually correct. It was clear that we needed to um, undertake a, a comprehensive re uh, a review of our programming from a, a critical and ethical standpoint. It was um, from this we began this process of unraveling the, the systemic inequality that has led to false narratives about numerous cultural groups which have uh, continued to be pervasive within our institution. This was really the catalyst for what I'm supporting uh, with um, uh, which is new co-curated Maasai educational resources. And we're in the process of developing these to generate uh, interest uh, and, and provide enrichment for visitors. So ultimately these resources are going to include new commissioned handling objects, a museum trail uh, and films that are going to feed into programming. And everything will be designed to be used in multiple teaching opportunities, for all audiences who visit the museum. So whether that's primary school, secondary school, families, or uh, older people groups. So because the Pitt Rivers has explicitly made a commitment to be a, an inclusive, reflexive, and thought-provoking museum that enables audiences to perceive collections from lots of different viewpoints, we're moving towards a framework of formal learning that from its very inception through to its delivery is collaborative. So this is a, a, a novel opportunity from which uh, we have the framework that we develop will uh, inform a model of best practice for programming in the future. This uh, will ensure that people are self-represented while centralizing voices that have previously been misrepresented or uh, even erased. Um, and working in this way will ultimately lead to holistic and culturally accurate uh, and mindful sessions which provide additional insight and fresh interpretations of material collections and cultural histories. So the guiding principles that will inform our practice are focused around empowerment um, and a heartfelt need for uh, decolonizing narratives and also knowledge sharing. And by knowledge sharing, what we mean is knowledge sharing that has been passed through generations, throughout generations, uh, that has sustained Maasai culture. And we also mean uh, knowledge sharing between cultures because this is a cooperative process that aims to be beneficial for all involved. So from stakeholders to staff to, to visitors. Another guiding principle is including uh, intergenerational perspectives and also uplifting voices of indigenous women, because something that was uh, raised as a, another issue of concern was the lack of visibility of women in the museum, especially considering, considering that many of the objects you will see on display were made by Maasai women. Not only that, women actively contribute towards a society and a cultural uh, resilience. Furthermore, another guiding principle is thinking about the intertwined relationships between us as people and, and, and nature. So uh, the, the process, it's, it's a process uh, that begins really with accepting accountability 
and it is followed by uh, observing the umbrella of power dynamics that have been in place and then uh, unpack how and why the power dynamics stand as they do. So on the surface, it's a practice of um, uh, misinformation and underestimate, uh, underestimation that uh, has spread um, in, in general in the West about African societies and landscapes and histories. And it's also the stereotypes that people still attribute with ease towards Africans that we are pushing against. Um, we see this in popular culture and we see this in the curriculum and we hear it in everyday conversation. So from the get-go, our conceptions of representation are all informed by this. And then when you look within the infrastructure of, of the, the museum, and the infrastructure that we use, you see this is really compounded by um, the remits of what information was collected and stored at the time and what now remains within the museum database records. So for example, the way um, objects in the museum were historically documented have, um, may have ignored uh, existing cultural uh, systems, reinforced ableism, the value of capitalism, scientific logic, racism, patriarchy, the gender binary. Um, some documents, uh, documented objects only have those material aspects recorded and very little uh, intangible heritage. So by this, I mean uh, any of the, the symbolism or philosophies that led to uh, the creation of these objects being absent. Strikingly, only 5% of the database has the, the name of the maker and sometimes the cultural group names or even the original language name were, were never recorded in, in, in the first place. And it's, it's really difficult to tell whether this was due to a lack of collector interest or carelessness, but it has led to the systematic destruction of indigenous knowledge in um, these spaces. And when you dig deeper, uh, you're then confronted with the reality of unethical collecting and um, you can follow uh, transactional histories of indiscriminate movements through families, uh, back and forth through museums, auction houses, private collections and, and, and galleries. So as a, a team, we've been thinking of a way to shift this dynamic. And um, one of which being uh, adhering to guidelines of engagement developed and written in this case in both Ma and English, by um, Maasai Treasures, which are one of the groups that we are working alongside. So in this case, the guiding principles for research provide clear, concise guidelines and definitions, creating a foundation for um, consensual, uh, respectful, equitable, and ethical partnership. It's important because future partners or researchers need to be clear about the uh, longstanding history of European exploitation of both material and, and intellectual property extraction. With this in mind, something that we're currently thinking around is uh, indigenous intellectual property rights, both tangible and, and intangible. So on one hand, gaining consent uh, from an individual research or knowledge holder contractually, but also thinking about uh, the fact that this uh, skilled work or this knowledge is not just the product of one person, it is communal knowledge. And uh, how do you vocalize this? So I'm, I'm going to finish by talking about uh, why community authored film is uh, part of the process. As mentioned previously, uh, self-representation is key to the way of, uh, of our working and developing these resources. And uh, this is why participatory film um, is a, a large part of the process to really positively promote cultural heritage defined and interpreted by communities uh, by their own terms. One of the most effective ways to do this uh, and share these narratives is through um, uh, this film, because it is an excellent method for instigating change in that power dynamic that was discussed earlier of the museum historically educating people about other people through a lens of Western experience and, and values. In this case, filmmakers such as Scholar and, and Amos and Sam have uh, creative control from start to finish and they can generate films which discuss topics and express narratives uh, to museum visitors via their own uh, uh, first-hand experience and expertise and, and have their own creative license throughout. So uh, what are we currently doing? 
we want to commission new objects for the museum's handling collection. Before I go into any more detail, let me break down what I mean by that. So the handling collection is an, a number of objects separate from the permanent collection, but essentially reflect what is in the collection that can be um, from the past or, or the present. And the key distinction being that you can handle these objects. And for this reason, they tend to be quite uh, sturdy and robust um, and, and are used to support public engagement. And they're picked up by many, many hands. Um, we haven't finalized the list of what these objects will be, but um, these objects will give us the opportunity to think about how knowledge transfer sustains uh, land use, languages, tradition, culture, and, and spirituality. And this is of course going to be complex because one, all objects are multifaceted in terms of their use, in terms of what they mean to society, in terms of what they mean personally. And two, we're attempting to teach one cultural system which teaches by learning by doing and values collective memory to another cultural system which teaches in a very literary based way. So we have the opportunity to create several short films, each will last about three to five minutes and all videos will be accompanied by text that will contextualize this footage. The text will be produced by knowledge holders and interviewees who will offer narrations about specific object and the text will be stored alongside photographs for further contextualization in the museum uh, objects database. With this in mind, um, here's an example of what we are want to do at the Pitt Rivers. So the museum currently has five calabashes, which are also known as gourds uh, in the handling collection. Um, we need to first address the cultural relevance previously taught. Secondly, correctly explain the value of calabashes in society, how they're made, their names, their uses, and then provide interpretations uh, which will be supported by an educational film. So calabashes uh, don't just represent one thing in isolation. Uh, they're 10 types. They have, have around 30 different functions and varying relationships with rites of passage, marriage ceremony, uh, blessings, feeding of infants, and medic uh, medicinal values, for example. So yes, uh, photographs and narration uh, will be documented. However, developing a film about the centrality of calabashes is especially meaningful because it gives space to express yourself as an individual but also share collective memory in a completely different format than uh, documenting in a, a literary way, which can often be quite impersonal. So on one hand, it's a wonderful way of connecting people on a personal level, but it's also, um, film has this capability to inspire and educate, which transcends being limited to that being in one space, say within the museum, right? So we really want to engage and reach people. So this is, really just been a brief outline of the, the work that the project has been doing um, with educational resources uh, and community or to film. So thank you. Thanks, Tandy. That's <clears throat> really fascinating to hear uh, the progress that's being made um, because um, we haven't, none of us have seen much of each other th uh, this year due to COVID and the museum being closed and, We've all been working on uh, on similar parallel kind of projects, which I might mention a, a little bit at the end of this uh, webinar. Just want to let um, the audience know that we are going to run past 6.30 tonight. We're gonna go probably close to seven o'clock. Um, we've got a couple of short videos to show you next, uh, but they're about two minutes long um, each. <clears throat> they, uh, they, they focus on two of the um, sacred artifacts that were found at the museum. Um, they've been made locally in Maasai land by the Maasai video teams. So they're coming up next. Um, we're going to hear again, hear, hear back from our Maasai um, panelists about the sort of next steps. Um, um, and then we're going to have a, a short uh, question and answer session as well. So we're going to have a chance to interact with the audience and for you, for you to send some, some questions uh, in the chat, which, which our panellists can uh, address. So um, Andy, if, uh, if you wouldn't mind showing us the two videos. So everybody bear in mind these are a work in progress. There are some mistakes in the subtitles and that kind of thing, but easily uh, rectifiable when we, when we get time to to go back and go back and work on them, but we just thought it'd be nice to show show you uh, the kind of um, material that's going to be coming through that the museum will be using uh, from next year as part of their um, a part of the collection.
kaji no rigiremisho ara no lesuloma na manya ngusero sambu alasane ora ra yo kerarma sai ora na rog na ji suruti ene ndoki atapat amore suruti ya no re piago entomononi na langa ngor bayana ninde na rodolu ajo ite engro or bayan ora na suruti ena ndoki atapat oleng amu endoki orporor na ji enorporor amore ra na ada be bonu irgori yanga ra na kare nor kori yanga ra na kare nor kiroi te ne bonu kiroi la mayo lo be mara na ge ba mu kimila na ndoki or masa nor ra bonu lo be kiriki ta kanyinyi na ni nde ngenda na ba ge ja na ba yel ni min ja suruti ya toli min ja suruti ya kata ore ndoki ni nje suruti ya na nkara inaki nkara inaki na ro rigo ge nkara ngar ba yel ni 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 pe ge mu pe la ku eni na enor ba yel ni ore sinya ga nya be mu ruwa ni ro ge hendi ja ni amerika na kara endi ro ma ra ra be ge ni ni yogu suruti ya na ji na ti enko bo mu sungu na ege mbo le ngamu ore na suruti ya na ege ara murku alang na na ege yo ege yo lo wa jo kara ra ge ntomono ni fa ga oru nu suruti ya ya mu ore na suruti ya ne mi ge nchoyo amu ore masa na ege ara ba ge ge ara suruti ya ge ara masa ba ge ha ge mi ge yu na ge ne ge nda undo ge nga ba ge ge mila na yo ge ntomono ore masa ara sa ne yo ne ge ni na ege ara masa nga ba na wa ge lo e bor na ege so ge ra na na masa nga ba na wa ge Amore na ba wa gna na masa na me yo na ifoiti E gi jona na ro de beji na na masa lo bor na gara ga gna na ro mono pa ga tra wuni na na ro gna ya mu ro gin joyo a mi gin joyo masa ang ta sama ni ni mi gin joyo ra ra ki A de de ga di ko nyokie na ro lo le mi weri na manyar ngaruwa ya basania ola yo ngoro ngoro ore dal lagadar na eriwa na no hina jimilla milla or masai amoro hi ngabila ni bo kina mara ana mara millenye ora baka kui o yu papa na la imeri na ra obor katar ore be e me kweri ne sho baba ore be e baba na sho nanu na gore mana e kor kadar ore ba e nanu na sho kon nagara ore be e kon nagara ne sho e du do ma de jane ki shui ta ra ma de jo ana ba be ki bulu e ala ma sai ki shu ne re bulu gwen ne nye na goro shar gadar milla na rugin talip na go ore ra ra de ne shor yen garai ore be elo ayen de na 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 ga ne mora ne mora de na ga rabar gadar le menye na go ore milla gadar na la yoni botor waya ara de ni ara la yo salasin na la yin ne balin deru ayu ni nyaya ore ganya be ni nye na la yin gotor le nye waya or katar la yele na bu ne ji sikunu no millar katar eri wan na mare jo milla wow i found that really moving to watch actually and i particularly liked the cow the beloved cow in the background of the second film um <clears throat> but yeah it's really it's very moving to see and to hear kind of from the source really um to learn about these objects and to really get a sense of the value the meaning the deep meaning of these uh, objects in in the maasai culture still today and how that maasai culture is still alive and very healthy and resilient despite hundreds of years of colonization it's a living culture and that's why we we named the project um the living cultures project and <clears throat> in fact the network the growing network of video collectives across africa across uh, indigenous communities uh throughout africa even in central america northeast india these are all part of the living cultures alliance of video hubs um 
a little bit later, I'll share some links in the chat for anyone who's interested in watching some of the latest videos and some really exciting work that's happening, that's been happening all through the year. Um, not directly related to this project with the museum, but um, <clears throat> a little bit different, which I'll talk about towards the end. So um, I'd like to welcome back our Maasai panelists, Samuel, Amos, and Scholar. Um, and I'd like to ask you, um, what does a decolonized museum look like? We talk, think, think, let's think a little bit now about the, about the present and future, the next steps. What would you, how would you like to envisage um, the museum such as the Pitt Rivers and the Museum of um, Archaeology in, um, in, um, in Cambridge that you visited and the Horniman Museum that you also visited? We visited three museums uh, in your last, uh, last visit in 2020. Yeah, tell us, a, tell us a little bit about your vision. Sam, do you want to start? Yes, sure. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, the first thing is we would like to, what I'm envisioning, what I'm imagining is a time when I get to a museum like uh, Pit Rivers, um, the emotion I'm getting, I will be getting is that um, I will be angry. I will be feeling uh, represented. I'll be feeling like I am at home, a place where I see the Maasai representing themselves. This is like last time when I, I visited or the first time I, I entered into Pit River, I was very much shocked and also annoyed. And I was controlling my emotion because it was very bad, not only from seeing what you, you could not expect, but also the, the, the narratives accompanying our objects actually do not represent who we are. So um, I'm envisioning if you would like to, to see or to, to be able to get into a museum uh, fully decolonized, one, I will see narratives from the indigenous communities, a proper narratives that tells about how we let we uh, objects and what um, how objects perpetuate our culture and how we use them on a daily life. But also, I would like to, when I get there, um, I feel like uh, this is a place to be. This is a place that can give me a welcome uh, in terms of uh, people valuing, people respecting, people um, curators who understand the connection between um, indigenous communities and their office. So this is uh, in brief uh, what I'm envisioning. And I know it's not very easy, but it is something what we are trying to, uh, to go into. Thanks, Sam. And Scholar, I invite you to, to add any, any, any words you'd like to, to add to that. Just about <clears throat> anything really that you'd like to talk about um, around this topic. Scholar, are you still with us? Oh, maybe she's, maybe she's dropped out actually. So whilst we wait for Scholar, maybe um, Tanya, you could, if you don't mind, you could try and just see if she needs any support to get back online. Um, Amos, please share with us your reflections. Um, yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, as my colleagues say that uh, we want to see the museum which is respect and recognize the culture of the people which are a place in the museum. We need to see the museum that really see the value of culture that they are going to uh, put in the museum. We also want to see the museum that really respect the narrative, that give the people, the indigenous people, an opportunity to give their own story and also respect the, their way of culture. Uh, in what I, we have seen in museum for some time, we see many things are not well represented. And as my colleagues say, they are not really telling their use. 
and I've witnessed myself many of the items which are not really telling the real meaning. And also the, we have objects that are having very many different meanings. And we like the museum to understand and try to give this meaning an opportunity for people to understand the of a culture they are really focusing to use in their education, especially in education department. During my visit to the Pit River Museum, I personally uh, addressed the education department and I told them that it is very important you teach the kid what is right. You teach the community what is right. And that is the what I want to see in the museum. When the education department or anybody involved in handling such object is fully aware of their use and fully understand the value attached to any particular object being presented to the audience. That is the envision I have uh, and I want to see that I want to see in the museum. And that is uh, if that happened, then it is also create a room that welcome the people who visit the museum. I feel like during our visit to a museum of archaeology, Cambridge, we, we really feel that a lot of as because of what we see. What really offends the other person, especially the indigenous community where the original uh, object come from and address that in a holistic way, in a way that respects the people where the object come from, then that is what we envision to see in Museum. Thank you. Thank you, Amos. Um, unfortunately, we have lost Scholar. Um, she, she probably, um, <coughs> her signal probably dropped. <clears throat> so maybe she'll come back uh, to join us for the Q&A session. Um, hopefully she will. Um, so what we do now is um, I, I did actually want to just give you a minute or two, um, Amos, to describe to us the Orkiyama process that Mokombo is suggesting uh, as a part of the healing process, because we've spoken a lot about the importance of um, the Maasai being in charge and in control of the narratives and representing themselves. But also a, of course a very important and big part of this project and it's a long-term project is 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 for healing that's really the ultimate aim uh, of this of this work we're doing together for a, a deep um, process of healing between cultures um, to heal the past and 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 uh, and rebuild a, a more equitable respectful relationship where we can really learn from one another. Um, and of course, this is absolutely relevant and pertinent uh, today as we approach the um, COP26 climate talks in Glasgow, starting at the end of this month, where, um, <clears throat> as I think I'm sure many of us know, indigenous peoples uh, have contributed the least to climate change historically, but are facing the consequences of climate change more than any other peoples on earth. And they also um, are the guardians or custodians of 80% of the remaining biodiversity on this planet that lies in their territories. And there's, there's no accident. That's because they are the true custodians of biodiversity and nature. They know how to live in harmony with nature in ways that the rest of the world must listen to now and, um, and must give a vo not only a voice, but a position of leadership uh, to indigenous peoples to help steer us out of this um, appalling ecological crisis that we're in and political crisis. Um, <clears throat> so, the Living Cultures Alliance across Africa have made films specifically for the COP26, for the uh, decision makers around the world and the people of the world. The series is called Listening to the Land. 
and um, I urge you all to, um, to check it out. Uh, we're going to share the link to the playlist on YouTube in a moment in the chat. Um, <clears throat> if possible, uh, could members in, of the audience share any questions you have uh, in the chat? I can see that there are some coming in now, so I'm just going to have a quick look at them. Um, so one question is, um, sorry, Tanya, while I, while I read these out, would you mind sharing the, the playlists uh, from the Living Cultures Alliance, the fellowship playlist, uh, which contains a couple of really interesting Maasai produced films on culture and the, uh, specifically on the cultural education system and also on an um, important sacred site uh, in the Loiter Forest. <clears throat> And then secondly, the COP26 playlist, so that um, anyone in the audience can uh, have a look at that later on this evening or another time. So yes, here are the questions, delegates. And I in invite um, Shomet and Yannick as well to uh, perhaps, um, if, you, if you would like to share, to, to try to answer some of these questions or to share some reflections, that would be wonderful before we, before we end. Um, <clears throat> so, are similar dialogues being started with the other museums you went to on your last visit? And is there anything that you would recommend we do or ask as we visit different museums around the world to help them start constructive conversations? So I think um, <clears throat> perhaps we divide that into two halves. The first half of the question about the other museums we visited, the Museum of uh, Anthropology and Archaeology in Cambridge and the, the Horniman Museum in London, we visited in 2020. Um, and let's hand over to, um, <clears throat> well, Amos already mentioned the really traumatic experience that you faced when you went to Cambridge and saw the six um, uh, okatar on the, on, on the table, uh, the bracelets. <clears throat> and for you, it was like seeing six dead bodies lying on that table. Right. It's a very powerful process. So yeah, perhaps uh, Amos, you can speak a little bit about the experience in Cambridge. That was a, a very powerful and a special couple of days we spent there. Um, and then the second part of the question, maybe Shomet, you could answer. Um, is there anything that you would recommend the people in the audience can do um, when we visit museums around the world to help them start constructive conversations. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nick, and uh, everyone. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I have, we had really had a very emotional experience and probably can call for a moment when we visit the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Cambridge. Because when we see uh, six or Qatar lying on the table, it's like we are seeing six dead body. This really traumatizes our experience and our feeling in the museum. And we are, for sure, we are not able to continue what we are seeing because we, we, we look like we are going to see many other things that are unpleasing to ourselves. So with that, uh, it was really, really a sad experience. And just to come back to your, your first question, you told me about all uh, <clears throat> Sorry, Amos, we've, we're, we're losing your voice. Perhaps you could take uh, take off your video. Okay, I mean, uh, I joined Council of. Okay, is it uh, is it okay? Yes, I think, I think it's better without the video. Yes, because we were losing your sound. Okay. Yeah, I just say briefly. I need to maybe talk a little bit about Olkiyama and the spiritual leader in this process. A spiritual leader is a, a supreme leader of the Maasai in terms of spiritual guidance. And it guides processes like this. 
where we need a deep reconciliation and healing process. The Olkiyama is a joint council of elders from all the because when we speak, we speak on, on behalf of many Maasai sections. And the authority is lying on the cultural leadership community. So that is what Okiyama means. And that is what gives direction to this process under the guidance of Makombo, the uh, chief Lebon. Thank you. And over to Francis. Uh, sorry, Shomet, would you mind unmuting yourself? You're still on mute. That's it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Am I, am I contributing to what Wakiyama is or just making my input? Well, what has uh, uh, transpired so far? Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to hear you, your input on whatever you'd like to share. Yeah, definitely uh, 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 the role of museums, decolonized the museum, should be to transfer uh, understanding and correct the epistemologies of indigenous people. Because as a result of colonization, uh, so much information inscribed on the objects in the museum are incorrect and misrepresent the indigenous people and the, 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 the knowledge or the epistemology of uh, relevant communities. So I envision uh, museums actually to be places where they transfer understanding, correct understanding, correct uh, narratives about the objects which, uh, which come from indigenous people, intellectual, um, uh, uh, intellectual uh, or intellectual uh, uh, property, because actually whatever is in any museum has been manufactured or made by a person using uh, uh, skills, you know, learned from the community and which represent the ability of relevant communities to use indigenous knowledge to develop uh, things. Two, the intellectual property rights should be respected because in our, in our current world, when a, a given company makes a watch, there is no way another company can make the same watch using the same technology. Intellectual property right of indigenous people should be respected. And this should be seen in any museum that intellectual property rights are not only respected, but should be promoted uh, on the global uh, scale. Because if there is any serious mistake that has happened, any serious injustice committed against indigenous people, it is actually uh, stealing intellectual property rights of indigenous people uh, through taking our objects and is putting them in the museums without any consent, without any any action on, on the part of the on the part of the indigenous people. Uh, like what would happen if I make the same watch which was made by a company in Europe? A serious crime and you are taken to court and you pay that through your nose. And this is not happening uh, in the museums with regard to the indigenous people. So that kind of understanding should be promoted by correcting narratives, by transferring knowledge and understanding about epistemologies of indigenous people. Thank you. Excuse me, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Shomir. Um, as we're, we're running low on time, there is a question uh, I'd like to direct it to Tandy. Uh, Tandy, the question is, <clears throat> T 
Tandy spoke about un unethical collection. What is unethical collection? I'm assuming she's referring to the stolen objects. Is there an issue from your point of view, Tandy, uh, around a problem or an issue around referring to these objects as stolen objects? Because I think the correct word is stolen. Part yeah. of the indigenous knowledge system in Africa is calling it as it is. Absolutely. Yeah, I was being extremely gentle with my language um, when I was using the word unethical. Um, I've heard this described in different ways. Uh, stolen, plunder, systematically looted, uh, obtained in illegal trade. So I'm, just, I'm literally reading from a list I put together uh, through immoral methodologies. Um, in terms of those five objects, yes, the word is stolen. I was just being gentle. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, Yannick, would you like to um, <clears throat> to add anything before we end? Um, Nick, thank you. Yes, I would like to add something. Yes, please put on your video so we can see you. We can see you. Someone else stops that video. Someone, maybe the host. Andy. I cannot put it to myself. I, I can't put it on, I'm afraid, for my end. Only you can. But um, I think Scholar is back in the conversation somewhere as well. You cannot stop your video because the host has stopped it. Anyway, uh, what I'm saying. I would like to respond to the question of on colonization of museums. And as you know, museums have uh, not just simple objects, but uh, objects that cross or cut across the cultural spectrum, um, including the livelihood of indigenous communities. So if you, if you consider communities like fishing communities, pastoralist communities, hunters and gatherers, whose objects are in the museum, and their livelihoods are being threatened right now by the same same concept of decolonization or, or colonization, to, to, uh, so to say. So museums have a big role to play, not just to decolonize um, themselves within themselves, but to influence um, the decolonization of other spaces. So the education department, for example, of the City Rivers Museum, a big role to play to influence the perspectives of other bigger or broader stakeholders to understand uh, the concept of livelihood of the indigenous and local communities whose objects are contained or are collected and stored in museums. So for example, in the future, in the very, very far future, you cannot have uh, objects from fishing communities if their fishing grounds are taken over. Or pastoralist communities if their land or their cultural um, sacred lands are taken over by um, other interests. So it would be, a, I think it is the role of the museums to educate not only the, the, um, the younger population, but I think the rest of the populations generally to understand uh, the connection of the objects they have in museums and where they came from. So that uh, if it is possible, People should, when people understand the origin of this object, then they can help uh, in the problems like restoration of, of rights, restoration of uh, identity, and all those. So, this is what I feel like, um, in general, would be the role of the museums in the future to be a nuclear uh, nucleus of education, of influence, of uh, awareness, um, so that 
I mean, we, I mean, that acknowledgement, the museums acknowledge that these objects come from indigenous communities, but they have broader interests, not just the objects in the museum. Thank you. Thank you, Yannick. Thank That's you. a really important point that you made there. Um, <clears throat> so I'd just like to um, invite Laura if you'd like to um, just any closing remarks and then and then we'll close the webinar. Um, yeah, um, thank you, Nick. And um, I'd say um, I, so to give closing remarks to such a very um, dense and important discussion is, is difficult um, because I think we've really um, had an amazing amount of uh, input that was important uh, for all of us to hear, uh, guiding us towards um, next steps um, again. Um, and I think the, um, the um, imagined future that Sam was um, sort of giving us a museum where um, one can go to and actually feel at home is exactly the, the uh, place where we would like to take the museum to, where one can hear um, self-representation is centered and indigenous um, narratives and stories are being told, not where somebody comes in and actually feels pain, but actually a place where people feel at liberty and actually um, to talk and to speak and um, that it's owned by the communities, um, which is why obviously we're developing new new ways of working. We're uh, looking at ways to redress and um, undo um, a lot of the pain. For the Pit Rivers Museum, um, that is a lot of work. Um, and I think I remember um, both um, Shomet, but also uh, Yannick, uh, and Yannick in particular saying, I feel sorry for you because you've You've, you've went out there, you've been collecting so many objects from across the whole globe. So there's a lot of work carved out for you. And I think that is where it's in the process of doing and undoing that we will find um, hope for um, other futures. And that's really where um, the work is situated. And so I wanna thank um, Sam, I wanna thank uh, Francis Chomet, I wanna thank Yannick and Scola and Amos. Um, for your you know, generosity. You also, Nick, for bringing us all together. And I think the films were really powerful. Um, so I want to thank everyone for their amazing engagement. And Tandy also for um, so um, capturing so brilliantly all the essences of the problems that we're dealing with in the, in the museum and trying to carve out you know, other ways of working. Thank you, Lau. Thank you, Laura. And perhaps could, could everybody turn their video on, all the panelists, one last time? Um, thanks, everybody. Wonderful to see you all. We've all become very close friends over this period of working together. It's been a real honor <clears throat> for us at Insight Share to work with the Pitt Rivers Museum, such a fantastic and pioneering, innovative institution and also with our Maasai friends. It's a real privilege and honor. Um, and we look forward to continuing the process, going deeper in the healing uh, over the next year. Um, and yeah, thank you very much to our lovely audience. <laughs>